Intellectual Innovations to support us with like improving upon, right? The current uh, work that we're doing in HIV prevention and care. So this is gonna be a great opportunity over these two days for us to look at examples of structural interventions that have like been currently working, recently working, right? They have been effective um, to approve upon what we're currently doing and also proven upon health outcomes in the West region of the United States. Next slide, please. So if you have not, and I see that Patrick's already started giving some shout outs of folks who did do this, but please put your, let's introduce yourself in the chat box. This is an opportunity for you to put your name and title, your organization and location, and just what are you hoping to get from this two-day experience? Um, so this is being recorded also, so we'll be able to have this and just know if we're being able to be aligned with what you all are doing and also who's in the space with us over these two days. Great. Kristen, Kristen, Kristen Varga was first up from Siskiyou County. Kristen, welcome. We have Deborah Reardon Maynard from the lovely state of Arizona. Welcome, Deborah. Keep them coming. Put your name yeah. in. John Murphy. Ooh, now they're coming in fast. <laughs> fast and so, furious. This is great. So I want to let us know that we are our community this over these two days, right? We are a village. So introduce yourself, know who's in the space, know who can call upon, right, to support us as we think about what sorts of interventions that we can use um, to support us, right, in thinking about our HIV prevention and care work. Next slide, please. All right. So this is more so just a little layout of what's going to be happening right over these two days. Um, the purpose of this right, is to provide participants with information on how structural interventions operate to address the environmental, social, and economic factors that influence individual risk and protective factors. Also, to provide uh, participants, you all, an opportunity to share and discuss examples of structural interventions related to HIV prevention and care. And then last, what we want to do is provide participants, right, with an opportunity to network with your peers on implementing structural interventions that align with the national HIV AIDS strategy and the ending the HIV epidemic um, in the United States, or what we know as EHE initiative. Next slide. So, yeah, this is just the layout, right? We talked to, you know, in house is what guides our efforts, right? And so this is what was done. Um, back in what 2021 or 2020, in which we begin to look at in house the goals that we set. These are the goals that we set right over the next three years. So from 2022 to 2025, these are the goals that we have, right? So we see a goal number one, what we want to do is prevent new HIV infections. Goal number two, improve HIV related health outcomes for people living with HIV. Goal number three, we want to, uh, I'm sorry, can you go back to the other? Thank you so much. Goal number three, uh, reduce HIV-related disparities and health inequities. And then goal number four, achieve integrated coordinated efforts that address HIV among all partners. So these are the goals that we set. From there, what we have is our Ending the HIV AIDS Epidemic uh, Initiative, which is going to use us, right, to set some measurable objectives of what some activities we can do to support us, right, in meeting these goals. Next slide. So... A lot of our work fall within these pillars. So we have the four pillars to end the HIV epidemic. We look at pillar one, diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible after infection. Go uh, pillar two, excuse me, treat the infection rapidly and effectively to, treat, uh, to achieve sustained viral suppression. Um, pillar three, uh, protect people at risk for HIV using potent and proven prevention interventions, including PrEP, a medication that can prevent HIV infections. Also thinking about ART as well. And then respond rapidly to detect and respond for growing HIV clusters and prevent new HIV infections. So we think about cluster detection response activities and other such response activities. This can support us. Next slide. So these are our learning objectives over the two days, you know, want us to get us to think about uh, or get us to define structural interventions, right, and the importance for addressing HIV-related disparities. From there, we want to describe the structural interventions that are currently being implemented um, for HIV prevention and care in the United States. Then from there, apply, right, the concepts of cultural humility to ensure SIs of structural interventions are culturally appropriate. We then want to go in to describe the methods that we're using to mobilize communities and gain buy-in support for structural interventions. 
and then increase self-efficacy to implement the structural intervention. So we have some great learning objectives, very comprehensive and robust, and we're hoping that you all can be able to um, feel like this is really meeting your needs. Next slide. So this is just a layout of a day one agenda. We're gonna do an introduction of structural interventions. Then from there, we're gonna have a nice community engagement discussion. We're gonna go into a break. Then we'll go into structural interventions and actions and looking at um, how that can support us and what that may look like. Uh, we also have the culture, humility, and institutional accountability, which we have a great case study from one of a state health department and showing how they use the structural intervention approach uh, to facilitate their own um, HIV intervention and care activities. Delivering trauma-informed care to reduce health disparities in vulnerable populations. Since many of us thought about ways to want to, right, it's for ways to operationalize trauma-informed care in our own health department or CBOs. And they have some Q&A and a day one wrap-up. Next slide. This is all about us to think bigger and better. I know many of us have like heard about structural interventions. Some of us may be implemented structural interventions. This is the opportunity, right, to think bigger and better ways of what we say connect the dots from what we're currently doing and making that much more bigger. How do we build onto that? So as you hear the presenter share real examples of structural interventions, just challenge yourself to think how your structural interventions can be bigger and better. How can you build on what you're currently doing? And also, as we look at various examples of structural interventions, that we just hope that you all will consider what they have done or could do to build highly impactful structural interventions. Excuse me, speaking a little fast, on a large structural interventions on a larger structural scale in your own jurisdiction. Next slide. So, just to get us all started, we want to just hear from you all through a poll, and from this poll, we're going to ask. How familiar are you with the conceptual framework of structural interventions? Are you familiar? Are you somewhat familiar? Are you somewhat unfamiliar? Or are you just not familiar? Again, this will be a poll that we're going to ask you all. And again, it's around how familiar are you with the concept conceptual framework of structural interventions? Familiar, somewhat familiar, somewhat unfamiliar, or not familiar? So we can put the poll up and let's see what folks have. All right. This is for us to get a feel for, you know, where folks are in the space. We'll give it another like 30 seconds. We're almost you know, if we can get us up to 80%, okay, we're at 100%, we'll close this. All right. So it looks as if that most folks are somewhat unfamiliar or somewhat familiar. And then we have folks uh, unfamiliar and familiar. So for my folks who are somewhat unfamiliar or unfamiliar, no worries, we got you covered. When you walk away, you will be somewhat familiar or familiar. And then for those who are somewhat familiar and familiar, what we're gonna do is get you to start thinking bigger and better, right? How can you build upon what you're currently doing or to build your own familiarity around structure intervention? Thank you for that. So what we're gonna do now is just get the ball rolling. We're gonna turn this over to Patrick Piper, who's gonna get us more around structure interventions. Great. All right, well, again, good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're thrilled to have you with us uh, for the next two days. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen. It should say an introduction to structural interventions. And uh, yeah, let's begin. Let me first um, tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Patrick Piper. I work with the California Prevention Training Center, and we are funded by CDC to provide technical assistance to a health department and CBOs across the country that receive funding from CDC. Um, and uh, we focus specifically on the Western region, which is why many of you here are probably somewhere within the Western region of the US. Uh, my background, I started in HIV prevention way back in 1992, in the last century, um, at Denver Public Health Department, where I coordinated a research project at the time called the AIDS Community Demonstration Projects. They turned into what is now known as Community Promise or Promise for HIP. Um, and it's one of the evidence-based interventions that CDC supports. Um, and, 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 Department of Public Health, this is Sydney. Oh, and then just to remind us, if you can um, put yourselves on mute, 
uh, when you're not speaking, that'd be great just to avoid background. Um, and we encourage you as much as possible to show yourselves, you know, this is a virtual institute, so we want to really make it as real as possible. So we, we encourage you to, to share your cameras when you feel comfortable doing so. Um, but uh, just to get back to this, I, I, I um, did this research project, which turned into Community Promise or Promise for HIP. And then, you know, like many of us in this field, we have the opportunity to wear a lot of hats. So I've done a lot of different things throughout the years, uh, everything from outreach to HIV testing, some case management. And then I uh, joined the training centers, first at the Denver Training Center. And I've been out here in California for the past 20 years, hard to believe, uh, at the California Prevention Training Center. So throughout my time in HIV prevention, we did a lot of structural approaches. And even back in the day with, uh, with the research projects that I was involved in, while we were looking at behavioral changes, we were looking at you know, individual changes, such as increasing condom carrying, increasing condom use. Uh, back then we were distributing bleach kits for injection drug users. Um, that was what we were measuring. However, throughout these interventions, we did a lot of structural approaches. Um, and so I, I may be touching on some of those experiences throughout my presentation this morning. I am here to just help us define structural interventions, to learn a little bit about how they're different from the other levels of interventions that you may be more familiar with, and then also to share some examples of structural interventions that we've been doing for HIV prevention and care in the U.S. Like um, Anshe said, uh, we encourage you to really use this time to think broadly, think big. What is some stuff, that, what, what are some things that we could do to up it a notch, you know? It's not to say that what we're doing is not enough, but there are a lot of structural barriers that still exist that explain why people may be hesitant or unable to access HIV prevention and care services. So whenever we identify those factors as being, we want to try our best to create interventions that address them. I'm going to be moving through a lot of information in a very short period of time. So if you have questions throughout, please put them in chat and we will be sure to check the chat several times each day to, to ensure that we are um, answering all of your questions. Uh, and certainly we will answer all of your questions before the end of the Institute. If we can't get the answer right away, we will get back with you with it. So all questions will be answered and we welcome all of your questions. All right, so let's begin uh, by just talking about what we mean when we say levels of intervention. So here in this first inner circle, you can see individual and group, also known as ILI. These are interventions that work one-on-one -on -one with individuals to assess their risk, to encourage positive behavior change. Some examples of individual level interventions you may be familiar with, certainly HIV testing, which is not always um, you know, an individual level. We know that we have couples testing we can do as well. However, for the most part, it is done individually. And um, another intervention you may be familiar with is the linkage to care intervention called ARDIS. Now, from the individual level interventions, we move more broadly and we go into a group level intervention. And these also are seeking to make individual behavior change. It's just that it's done within the context of a group setting. And so often there's some sort of a skills building component involved with it. Uh, you certainly have social support in a group setting, and that's really the, um, the, the thrust of a group level approach is that you're providing opportunities to practice, to develop skills, and you're providing a sense of support. Um, and so group level interventions, uh, while they're not being supported um, anymore by CDC, but some that you um, may have heard of are things like healthy relationships, many men, many voices, SISTA, and so forth. Um, and so those were kind of historic group level interventions uh, that CDC supported. And then we move into the community level realm. And this is where um, you're now you're, you're not only concerned about making or encouraging individual behavior change, but you're looking more broadly to create social support, to change social norms and attitudes and beliefs 
this is done on a broader community scale. And I think the biggest difference between um, community level approaches and the individual or group level approaches is that when you get to the community level, you're really looking at changes in social norms. That The idea is that we want the community to support all of the interventions that come, bef you know, that come before it. Like, I, I, I always like to think of, um, of this as, like, say I go and get tested and I find out that I'm somebody living with HIV and I want to tell people, you know, to gain support. Um, so the, the, uh, the counselor refers me to a group level intervention that deals with disclosure. And at this group level intervention, I learn all these great skills about how to uh, disclose my status and I, I know what to say and I'm feeling confident. And then I go back to my community where nobody is talking about HIV. Nobody is saying they are living with HIV. You know, how likely is it that I'm going to be successful when I begin to try and do this new behavior, disclosing my status? And that's where the community level interventions come in and they create that community buy-in and that support for all of the other stuff that I'm gaining through the individual and group levels. Okay. And that's kind of how it goes up. And then finally, and, and Promise for HIP uh, is currently being supported by CDC, and it's, uh, it's a community approach. And then finally, structural level interventions. These are interventions that seek really to, and I'm going to talk more about this, but they're really trying to change availability, acceptability, or accessibility to HIV prevention care and services, um, and, and care services, rather. Uh, so these are influencing an environmental factor or they're influencing a big um, social factor that we want to try and uh, cre remove the barriers to service and create facilitation of access to services. And so on the structural level, you're looking at often at policy, at laws, at structures, you know, access, transportation, big things. You're, you're often addressing many of the social determinants of health when you're looking at a structural uh, level intervention. And that is what we're talking about for the next couple of days. Things like condom distribution, and the, these are um, uh, structural approaches that CDC is supporting. And then certainly syringe service programs. And you all know that there are many political aspects to uh, creating SSPs. Uh, that we need to address before we're going to be successful. And that's what we're talking about when we're looking at structural level approaches. Okay. What I do want to say that um, traditionally this is kind of felt daunting to a lot of agencies that I've worked with. It's like, oh my gosh, how do we, how do we operate on these big macro level um, levels? <laughs> and, and, you know, can we really do this? And I just want to say that all of us are players. None of our agencies are expected to do a structural inter intervention all by ourselves or all alone. In fact, you shouldn't. Um, so keep that in mind as well, is that any little thing that you're doing, like making your hours more um, applicable to the communities that you're working with. If you are a nine to five agency and your entire community works from nine to five, you may want to think about making a structural adjustment to your hours and create evening hours or weekend hours or what have you. And, and, and while that seems you know, fairly easy to do, um, there's a lot of structural stuff that goes into it. So let's be thinking about those levels. And that goes anywhere from changing your hours all the way up to making changes in law and policy. Um, and we have some um, workshops that you'll learn about today and tomorrow that have done this. Um, so we're gonna be sharing that with you. All right. Now, another aspect of structural interventions is that they're able to reach large groups of people. So this diagram here just illustrates the intensity and we're defining intensity as the level of service delivered to each individual. OK, so how much service is each individual getting with the intervention that we are uh, relating to the scale of impact? Now, this is the number of people reached through the intervention. So if you notice on the left there, the intensity pyramid, the ILIs and the GLIs are a lot more intensive. Okay, so you're, the, the individual is getting a lot more attention 
from those interventions. And you can see as we move up that we move into the community level, that's somewhere in the middle, and then structural level per person, you know, it's not as intensive. Okay. However, when you look at the reach of the intervention, you see the reverse. And so that you can see with these structural levels, it's reaching everybody, right? They may not be um, getting, you know, all of that individual attention uh, on, on themselves as far as individuals in the community, but the reach, the community now is being affected by the intervention on a much larger scale. And you can see that as you move into the individual level realms there, um, it becomes less. You're not reaching as many people, but they are getting more intervention is the idea. So this is not to say that one level is better than the other. It's just you want to look at your scale of reach. How many people are you trying to reach? What is it that you're trying to do in the intervention? And what can you afford to make it the most cost effective? So structural level interventions, typically, you're getting more bang for your buck um, when you operate on a structural scale. Okay. So and again, we welcome any questions in the chat. So what is a structural level intervention? I know I'm doing a lot of talking, uh, but I'm going to try and move fast. Structural interventions really operate to create or address an environment that's supportive of the whatever it is that you're trying to do on the community level. So structural interventions, you know, you're addressing those environmental, social, economic factors that influence individual behavior. Okay. They don't rely on individual change. So the actual individuals that you're accessing in the structural level interventions are going to be influenced by all of the other environmental and social things that are going on that are a result of operating on a structural level. Okay. They often require changes in policy, laws, or social structures. So there's this idea that they're a little bit more complex to implement, and that may be true. I mean, you, you're definitely getting a lot more um, input than you might on lo other levels of interventions from a broader um, segment of the community. They may take longer to fully implement because, as you know, we can, we can create a group level intervention pretty easily, right, and, and get it on the ground and, and start intervening. Um, but when you're looking at changes in laws, or changes it, like we've seen with with the syringe uh, programs you know laws had to change paraphernalia laws and so forth in order to make those interventions successful and so they typically require you know uh, parity and inclusion from a broader um, segment of the community so you're working with a lot of invested partners when you're working on the structural level okay an example um, that many of us in California may be familiar with that happened fairly recently, we wanted to use this as just a quick example of kind of how something might be operating on a structural level. And this was the County of Los Angeles uh, several years ago, let's see, in 2012, actually. Um, they were concerned about the lack of condom use among adult films and in the adult film industry. And so um, a person from the community uh, who owned, well, not owned, but was a CEO or is a CEO of an aid service organization, put forth a bill that would require condom use uh, for all adult films that were produced in Los Angeles County. And if you remember, those of you who remember this, it made it all the way up to the state ballots, but it started here at LA County. The measure required condom use and um, regular HIV and STI screening. Um, they were also, the porn production uh, companies were also required to obtain health permits um, as a means of compliance and as a um, requirement in order to produce these films in LA County. Well, it passed. It passed on the county level. And that means that it was shown that, yes, we, the people agree that this should be done. Um, now, what had happened afterwards is you know, and, and the proponents of this were saying, well, there are high rates of STIs there. I think there were some high profile um, HIV transmissions that occurred in the porn industry uh, at that time. And so they used this um, as a backing for their argument that condoms should be uh, required. 
And however, when it went all the way up to the state, um, the state knocked it down and they, they said that they would not on a state level make such a requirement. Okay, so this is just an example of how, you know, you can see that uh, when you're operating on that structural level and you put these laws into place, it's no longer my individual choice whether or not to use a condom if I'm a, an adult film actor, right? Because the environment requires it, the laws and the policies require it. And so if I'm going to be there, my behavior automatically changes. And that's an example of how changes in law and policy trickle down to influence individual behavior, you know? And who knows, you know, from, from having that experience, say I'm an actor in the adult film industry, maybe now when I leave the adult film industry, I'm, I might still be using condoms as a means of protection. I mean, that's kind of a, a guess, and unless we do a research project to evaluate that, we don't know for sure, but that's the idea behind it. Um, so this is an example of a structural intervention in California that we did with regard to HIV uh, prevention and care uh, fairly recently, 2012. All right, so, and you can look uh, about that. We have resources for you and we will be sure to get you um, resources to all of the information that went into our presentations. So let's talk some about characteristics. Uh, of a structural level intervention. And I already talked about this a little bit, so I'll go through this quickly. Basically, you're reaching a lot more people. You're able to reach a big, big part of the peop part of the population who may not otherwise be reached, and it may not even be on their radar screen because maybe they're not personally invested in it, right? That they're not feeling at risk for HIV, for example. So, but you're gonna be reaching those people still. Um, condom distribution is a really good example. By making condoms available, Anybody who enters that environment, you remember before in Walgreens, you used to have to ask the pharmacist or whatever, and now you can get some of these family planning materials right over the counter, and anybody can go and get them. That's an example of a structural intervention. Um, so they're, they're implemented at a broader level, okay? And they're not focusing on um, increasing like my perception of risk. They're not really focusing on my individual knowledge or behaviors, Rather, they're focusing on accessibility, availability, or acceptability, the three A's, and we're gonna learn more about those. They can be conducted at many levels. Okay, so structural interventions can be conducted um, at the community or neighborhood level, right there in the middle. And that's when, again, we're looking at really uh, changing norms, changing values, beliefs, changing support, systems. Um, and so things like public health departments, if you think about those as a structural intervention, before we had public health departments, look at disease control and things like that. It was not nearly as effective as it is today. And the reason is because we put that structure in place, the structure of public health departments. And um, so then, you know, I'm, I'm kind of skipping the society level because that's, we just kind of talked about that, um, that those big, broad, structures that are in place but let's go down to the organizational level because that's where a lot of us are going to be doing this type of work in our current roles right so in an organizational level you can see that these are structural things that are done in the organization i already talked about changes in your hours um, and things like that that's an example of a structural level maybe um your AIDS clinic has a big AIDS clinic sign outside the front door, or maybe it's even in your name and, and people don't want to access the AIDS clinic, right? And so we have to think about how can I make this more accessible and acceptable to my community? Maybe take that sign down or maybe embed your HIV prevention services, integrate them with other services that your um, agency is offering. And that way you're not furthering stigma by separating out HIV and making it its own thing, people are going to be a lot more um, uh, probably willing and uh, interested in accessing services on that level. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's kind of clear. I've been talking about these three A's, so let's talk about them a little bit more. They really are important, and I know this slide is a little busy, so, so bear with me. Um, these three A's were originally described by Dr. Kim Blankenship, um, who's kind of a guru of structural interventions with regard to HIV. Um, and 
she looked at three contextual factors that affect health, and that is the availability, accessibility, or acceptability. Now, when we look at acceptability, okay, we'll start there. These are interventions that are making it acceptable. It's acceptable to have a syringe services program in my neighborhood, right? If, if the neighborhood does not support it, again, we need to do that, do something about that because otherwise we're spinning our wheels, we're wasting our time because people are not gonna access the services for fear that they'll be discriminated against or for fear that there could be legal repercussions, anything like that. So we need to make them acceptable, acceptable to the community, okay? Next we have accessibility. And this is, you know, can people access what it is we're selling, right? Can I can do all the commercials in the world, and if I don't have uh, the product available, then it's a waste of time and money. So we don't want to do that. So if you find that accessibility, people are not able to access what it is that you're selling, then that's where we want to focus our attention. And so these are things that are going to be increasing accessibility. Those those hours, the long, you know, nighttime hours, weekend hours moving the condoms to where people can actually get them. Those are examples of things that, are, that you're doing on the accessibility. And then finally, availability. And this is really similar to accessibility, but availability is more, things can be accessible, but if they're not there, if all of the machines are empty, then what good does it do, right? And so when you think of drug stockouts, which we don't really have too many in this country, but um, drug stockouts or um, where condoms aren't available and you can't access prevention materials, uh, the morning after pill, things like that. You know, we're, we know that we're, we're living in a kind of a contentious society right now where um, these things that were available may no longer be available. And we really need to be paying attention to that because if that becomes the issue, then that is going to be the barrier. And that is an example of something not available to help our community stay healthy. So that's where we're gonna to need to put our energy. Um, and so you can see here examples that we have under the availability are things like mobile clinics, you know, taking the services to where the community is um, and condom distribution again, is currently being supported by CDC. So these are the three A's and your structural intervention will most likely be um, operating to address one of these. All right, so let's talk about components. All of these things are things that could be included in your structural intervention. The first are uh, addressing access. So we just kind of talked about that, but it's the provision of a health product or service that makes products available and accessible to the intended users. So. Um, examples include like HIV testing centers, or like I said before, expanding hours of operation. Capacity building. And so change that improves on an organization's ability to provide services or programs. What you're doing right now is capacity building. You are getting this information so that you have the most recent uh, state-of-the-art information with regard to structural interventions, and that way, you're building your capacity to serve your populations better. And that is what we mean by capacity building, investing in staff training, um, things like that would fall under this realm. One of the key components to anything that we do, and certainly to when you're talking about community mobilization, you're talking about community engagement. And we know that without the buy-in and support of the communities that we're working in, we're just, we're not going to be successful if we don't have that level of buy-in. So community mobilization efforts really seek to uh, provide opportunities for your community to be involved in the intervention and to uh, really own the intervention so that it's a community-driven um, activity, okay? It's not coming from the top down necessarily, but the community is supporting it. We often use mass media. So when you think about social marketing campaigns, what are you doing in social marketing campaigns, right? You are, a lot of them are trying to operate about uh, the acceptability of things. So a social marketing campaign, we've all seen them, could be don't smoke in public, right? Um, typically these type of uh, interventions use mass media. 
So you're using the radio, you're using the TV, internet, billboards, that kind of thing. Um, and you're, you're harnessing the power of mass media. And we know that with social media today, this is a vital component. Uh, so your structural intervention will be operating using these type of structures, which brings us to physical structures. So when we talk about physical structures, it's that aid sign that I was saying, right? It's, are there clinics available in my neighborhood? Do I need a mobile clinic? Is transportation a big issue? We've come such a long way there, you know, it's, it's just amazing, just in the amount of time that I've been involved in, in this work. You know, when we started out, we didn't really, nobody really had cell phones. <laughs> it's hard to, ah, it's hard to imagine that, but, you know, and so we've got a lot on our side today to be able to help us with some of these things. And we need to be sure that we're using everything we can to uh, to create, you know, availability and uh, get our interventions to where they need to be. Um, your structural intervention most likely will contain um, policies and procedures uh, in order for these activities to be carried out. So uh, an example that I think about um, that I was involved with was when we first started hang handing out bleach kits. And for those of you who may not have been here, um, you know, we before the new needle every time, we knew that bleach was somewhat uh, effective in killing HIV anyway, not necessarily hepatitis, but HIV. And so that was the message. And we were passing out all these bleach kits, but guess what? The police departments considered them paraphernalia. And so we found out that, you know, all of this effort and all the money we spent passing out these bleach kits and people were getting busted if they had them, even though they had the, the public health department logo on them. So we really had to operate on a lot of that structural realm to, to change some of those laws and policies to involve the police departments in our efforts. And over time, uh, you know, they, they, they quit busting people for bleach kits. Um, and then, as I said before, a lot of these structural level approaches are addressing some something that would fall under this social determinants of health. Um, and these are social, economic and physical uh, structures that exist there where people are born, where people live, work, pray, play, age, all of that. This is the um, social structure that exists and you know we know that things like um transportation is a real easy one that i think of a lot because if you're out in the rural area you know that it's difficult for people to be able to access some of the things that we take for granted in some of the urban areas and so that's one example of a social determinant of health um, and and you know i'm breezing through this we offer um an online course, we offer different opportunities for you to learn more about everything I'm talking about, but so you can access that um, when we leave here. But I just want us all to be on the same page. So, you know, social determinants of health include things like HIV stigma, homophobia, any of those social um, attitudes or social structures sometimes, if, if, if you have a sodomy law uh, in your state, and I think that there are still 13 states that have a sodomy law. Um, you know that that's creating barriers for people to be honest and access your services. So we want to be operating, addressing those social determinants of health and structural interventions are often doing that. So that, my friends, is a down and dirty component of structural interventions. I wanted to give you some examples of structural interventions that we're doing currently in the U.S. With regard to HIV prevention and care, the first is community engagement. I can't say enough about this. We've got to get the players from, think about the non-obvious players. Who's not at the table, right? Or who's not um, able to access what's at the table, if, even if they're sitting there. So how can we really get important buy-in from the communities that we're working with? Because this is how we're going to make these large social changes some opportunities that you can think about um, that would fall under community engagement would be things like volunteerism so volunteering at a food shelter at a, a food bank um, at a homeless shelter that kind of thing creating community gardens bringing people together to better their communities uh, same thing with like local farmers markets 
you know, create by the people for the people, be thinking about that kind of thing, support groups in the community. Um, and then certainly attending your community functions such as town halls, creating community forums, sharing with the community everything that we're doing behind the scenes. I can't tell you, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, uh, but how many times do we go out and do a wave of data collection and we have all this great data and we know what's going on at the community, but the community never hears back. You know, we, we collect all this data, we file our papers, we, we get published and do, so on and so forth. But the community never he hears whatever happened with their data. And that's why it's vitally important that we do things like create these community engagement opportunities so that we're sharing the information with the community. OK, condom distribution. I've talked a lot about this, but if you're operating on the uh, acceptability, then just having the condom machines there or moving the condoms is going to start to influence the acceptability of it. Right. That's the idea anyway. Um, and certainly if availability is an issue, hey, put the condom uh, machine in the, the men's room or the, the gender nonspecific uh, restroom or whatever it is, wherever people are going to be able to get them. Um, and traditionally, you know, we've seen those machines in restrooms, at rest stops and things like that. But why not put them at the club or why not put them wherever people are going to need them? Uh, so that's kind of an idea behind the condom distribution as a structural intervention. We talked about social marketing, and this is a, a social marketing campaign that CDC is currently supporting, and that is the uh, Let's Work Together to End HIV, Let's Stop HIV Together is the name of the campaign. And this is just one uh, poster, you know, that, that is part of that campaign. There's a whole series, and you can look at those at CDC's website. But this is really, um, like I said earlier, trying to influence the acceptability realm of those three A's, okay? Service integration. So why do I need to go to this clinic to get my birth control and this clinic to get my hepatitis test and that clinic to get my STI screening and another clinic to get my HIV test? That's just not the best way to do it. I mean, it's commonsensical, right? So how can we integrate our services? Often we're dealing with people who have needs across social services. So why not just have the food stamps with the condoms? Why not just have the testing with the, you know, whatever it is? How can we integrate our services so that people aren't having to drive all over town, take buses all over town? We want to make this available and accept, accessible to the community. Okay, so service integration is another thing that they've been doing. And certainly we all know the importance of stable housing, which is a really big issue. If you, I, I'm not going to say a lot about this because I think we all know, but if you don't have a refrigerator, you don't have a place to keep your stuff, how are you going to stay adherent to your meds? How are you going to even have the basic necessities that you need to stay healthy? And that gets compounded when you have a, you know, a health condition like HIV or something like that. And that's, that was, thank you. Does that mean, I think that mean, must mean my time is up. They're giving me the hook. So, um, any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I think we have time for maybe two questions, if there are questions right now that I can address. Um, let's, uh, let's take a couple questions and we'll move forward. There aren't any chat, uh, questions in the chat at the moment, but oh, we right. are going to have a community break, I mean, a community discussion. So we're hoping that maybe some of these questions are asked during the community discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be a good opportunity for folks to maybe share and maybe even ask additional questions based upon what was shared. You've been thinking about the three A's, susceptibility, availability, and accessibility, and also those components of structural interventions. Great. Well, that's all I've got for you fine people. It's good to be here with you. Thank you for letting me talk at you a little bit about an overview of structural interventions. And I'll turn it back over to Anshay.